to the Lord. Hey, do me a favor. Stand to your feet, please. Will you, will you just walk around, just somebody near you, just give them a fist bump, a high five, a Holy Ghost wink right now, and just tell them, ain't Jesus good? I know that's not good grammar. That may not be proper grammar, but that's good preaching. Come on, just tell them, ain't Jesus good? Y'all ever been at grandma's house and had some biscuits and molasses? You know, good, when, when that's the place, tell them, Patrick, when that's the place, good takes on two syllables, like good. Jesus is good. Hey, church, you're in for a tremendous treat today. Um, we were so blessed um, already at the 9 a.m. and going to be blessed now. A couple of years ago, um, I was actually in Dallas. I was visiting pastors Ben and Kim our lead pastors, and I was uh, at their house, actually, and we were having a conversation, and I'll never forget, I think it was in 2017, 2018, Pastor Ben, um, he, he, he said, man, I want to I wanna tell you, I want to introduce you to a couple that are amazing that we've recently been connected to, and he said, through mutual friends, and he said, man, I just really think they would be a blessing to you and Kayla, to Calvary Wallace, to the Wallace campus. He said, they're just really gifts and I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to see where God's going to take this relationship um, that he's blessed us with. And, and he said something that really, it still resonates with me today. I can still recall that conversation because he said something that actually is, is more rare than it should be. He said, one of the things I love about this couple is they're amazing, their gifts. He said, they got tremendous ministry, great teachers. He said, but they live what they preach. I'm going to tell you something. I don't know if there's a better compliment for a preacher than to have someone say they live. In other words, what they preach on the platform is expressed in their everyday life. That's a tremendous, tremendous thing. Now, you talk about the extreme example of integrity. That's it. Because there's a lot of people that preach. But to live it out is a, is a tremendous gift and what a blessing it is. So we connected. We connected by text. Uh, and then we um, were very blessed that not long after that, Ashley was invited to be a part of our board of directors at Calvary Church. So we were on Zoom calls together at board meetings and um, began to develop a, a long-distance relationship. I uh, familiarized myself with their incredible ministry. That was a, a, a just a, it's, it's incredible what God's done in and through them. Not only is their teaching ministry such a blessing to so many, but they oversee a network of pastors and leaders um, that's scattered all out throughout the the planet, they, um, they're always ministering, they're traveling to and from. They could have been anywhere they wanted to this weekend, and they chose to be in Wallace. And um, I've been looking forward to this day for a long time. In January, I was in Oklahoma City at Bishop Tony Miller's uh, life celebration, a uh, celebration of life service. And um, as I was there, I was talking to some friends, and all of a sudden, I heard a voice call my name. And I knew it wasn't from Wallace. I could tell by the accent. I knew that wasn't a chinkapin accent. Come on. Uh, and I, I turned around, and it was it was Ashley Terridez, and he, we hugged and just talked about how excited we were. I think we had just set the date to, to get these guys here. The last couple of days, Kayla and I have had a chance to spend some time with them, and they are tremendous blessings and gifts. And I tell you, as amazing and powerful as their ministry is, I'm as excited about the relationship as I am anything. Some people God sends on assignment to simply deposit a word into this house, and I'm always grateful. But occasionally, rarely he sends somebody not only to come just speak a word into this house, but also to enter your life that's not going to be a quick exit, somebody that's going to enhance and add value to your life through the gift of relationship. And I believe we found that in both Ashley and Carly Terradez. They are, they have tremendous resources. Make sure you go by there. I don't know if the nine o'clock wiped out the table or not, but if not, you can go to their website. But I, wonder, I, I encourage you to get everything you can get your hands on because they've got teachings. They've got books. Both of them had authored um, tremendous books. And I encourage you to, to make sure you take advantage of that and, and get familiar with their ministry because it will absolutely bless you. You remember him from Pandemic Proof where he talked about pandemic proofing our finances. One of the greatest messages on faith and finance that I've ever heard. He has actually joined us in our teaching team in some of the past series we've done on finances and that's also added tremendous value to this house and you didn't even know it. But we are honored to have them here today live and in person. They oversee a network of pastors. They do a lot of great ministry all across the planet but the greatest gift they are is that they're real and they love sharing the love of God with everyone they come in contact with. So I want you to do me a favor and welcome our new friends and family to this house. 
Calvary Wallace, stand to your feet. You're going to hear from Carly in a little bit. But put your hands together and thank God for the gift he sent us in Ashley Terradez. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Man, God is so good. That was a, I'm blessed by that welcome. Almost, almost tearing up. I get emotional sometimes, but it's, we feel the same, and, and um, I feel like I'm part of the Calvary family. So honored to be here. I love your pastors. Um, really got to know them. And you know what? You've got great pastors. If you didn't know it already, let me just say, pastors Brad and Kayla are awesome pastors. They're here serving you, loving you. There's a lot of other things they could be doing. But you know what, they're, they're doing this sacrificially, so I want you to honor them. Sometimes when people are close to you and you see them every day or see them every week, familiarity, you know what, sometimes you don't quite, um, you know, realize what gift you have. But I'm telling you, you have a gift in this house with your pastors. Let's give your pastor a hand. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Come on. Amen. Amen. It's powerful. So powerful. Honor you guys, love you guys, and I believe that I believe we're, we're we're on a road together. Praise God! So we may be a few thousand miles away, but we'll um, we'll we'll run this race together, and and uh, we're all the same age. I know they look a lot younger than us, but they're actually the same age. Do you believe that? I think Brad may have me beaten by a few weeks, even. So anyway, so we're so blessed to be. Hey, if this is your home church, congratulations! You go to a great church. You go to a church that's going to build you up in who you are in Christ. You go to a church that's going to teach you the truth. Amen. Come on, give it up for Calvary Wallace. I'm telling you what. And if this is your home church, congratulations, praise God, you, you, it's awesome. And if this is your, not your home church yet, if you're just visiting here or, or if you're uh, you know, watching online, then I'd encourage you, you know, you're going to get the, the life of Christ here, you're going to get the truth, you're going to find out who you are in Christ and who he is in you, and you're going to leave church feeling better than when you came in, which you can't say about all churches. Some churches you go to and it's like, you, you th- the sun's shining, I feel pretty good, you walk into church, you hear an hour of the past, the beating you over the head with a stick, you come back and man, I'm just a dirty worm, I'm a dirty sinner, I've got to do all these things to please God, well that's not going to happen here, here you're going to get the truth, praise God, and you're going to find out who you really are in Christ, and all the people watching online, I, I just checked on my Facebook, there's people watching all around the world online right now, and you know people will watch later as well, so welcome everyone online, you can tune in, make sure you tune in next week, same time, uh, same place. Tune in next week and Pastor Brad will fix everything I've said this week. So you'll be blessed. In fact, he's going to continue his, his series on Captured by Grace, a powerful series. So make sure you tune in next week. You're going to be really blessed to do that. And again, if you're here in person visiting, come back next week. You'll be really blessed, praise God. Next week, the pastor won't have an English accent. If we need an interpreter, we can fix that. You know, I came over here 13 years ago and I had lots of people, especially from the South. And I love North Carolina. This is this is not our first time in North Carolina, but it's our first time in Wallace, North Carolina. I said, my friend said, where are you traveling this weekend? Because we travel nearly every weekend. We just come back from Nashville two days ago, and uh, we travel nearly every weekend. And they said, where are you going next weekend? I said, Wallace. They said, where's that? I said, exactly. <laughs> I said, I don't even know, praise God. You know what? I found a treasure right here, the body of Christ, best kept secret, I mean, Calvary Wallace right here. So um, we're so blessed to be here. But my accent, if you can't understand me, then, um, you know what, just a wave or we'll get an interpreter or something. <laughs> I've preached before now for like half an hour and had people come up to me and say, great word, actually, great word. I couldn't really understand you. <laughs> but great word. I was like, they just received it by faith, you know. That's what we so I'm learning to speak American as well as English, uh, bilingual, praise God. I said, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things, I won't go into it now, but there's a lot of things you've got to be careful of. If you ever go over to England... And you use your American words, just be careful. Some words in England mean different things than they do here. I found out the difficult way. I'm I'm going through my Rolodex of embarrassing stories about words I've said from the stage. And none of them them are appropriate. I can't share any of them. I can't share any of them. Anyway, praise the Lord. I embarrassed myself once. I'm not going to do it again. So, awesome. So, anyway, turn to your Bibles. um, Oh, one thing I'm I'm going to... tell you about real quickly. I have a book called Thorns, Barns, and Oil Jars, and, and Brad was so kind, Pastor Brad was so kind to tell you that we have resources out there. Go ahead and grab things. If for some reason you haven't got money to buy things, let us know. We'll, we'll send you away with free stuff, but I'm going to give every single one of you, regardless of, of whether you're going to afford it or not, I'm going to give you this book free of charge. Um, we haven't got enough with us today to give you, but you can get them online. Uh, I think there's a postage charge of like two or three bucks. That's all you've got to pay. We don't get any of that. That goes straight to the UPS, but the book itself, we'll give it to you, and we'll also give you the Kindle version completely free. So, um, if you go on our website, teradesministries.com forward slash thorns. Now, I know here in North Carolina, it's forward slash thorns. Is that right? 
Is that better? Thorns. Forward slash thorns, okay? I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. If I was American, I would be born in the South. I have to say, I love the South. You have the best food, best hospitality, praise God. So I love the South. So anyway, thorns, barns, and all This is about finances, about how you can prosper God's way. And God wants every single one of us to prosper. In fact, he's provided for us. In fact, it's part of the gospel. Part of the gospel is that he's going to be our provider. You know, I was in Africa one time, and the pastor said, we've got some issues. Some people are upset about me bringing you into my church. I said, why? He said, well, because they said, don't bring this American prosperity gospel teacher to your work, to your church. I was like, this is going to be interesting. I said, first of all, so I got up on the podium. First of all, as you can tell, I'm not American. They're like, he's not American. He's English. What do you do with that? And I said, second of all, I said, the prosperity gospel is a lie. And I saw the pastor on the front row going, where's he going with this? It's a lie. There's no such thing as a prosperity gospel. There's only one gospel. That's it. One of the side effects of that gospel is he's going to provide for us. He's going to provide for us. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, yet though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that us through his poverty might be made rich. Just like he became sin for us, so that we can take on his righteousness. Just like he took pain on his body, stripes on his back, so we could take on his healing. Just like he took anxiety and turmoil in his mind, so we could take his peace. He took our poverty and lack on the cross, so that we can take his prosperity and provision, praise God. And we need to understand this, and there's a balance to this. The body of Christ can get into two ditches. We can either neglect it or, or, or abuse it. And I, I heard this story one time of a lady. She bought her elderly father an iPad for his birthday. And she sent it to him, you know, when the iPads first come out. And she thought, this would be good. He can, like, FaceTime and go on the internet and read newspapers and all that. So she went to visit him a few months later. And she said, Dad, how do you like the, the birthday gift? He said, I love it. He said, I use it every day. And he went in the kitchen and started chopping carrots on it. <laughs> put it in the dishwasher. Like that. So that was a $500 chopping board. Okay, if you don't understand the purpose of something, you're going to abuse it. And the purpose of prosperity is to establish God's covenant. Uh, Deuteronomy 8.18, it says, you know what? He's, he's uh, given us the power to get well so he can establish his covenant. Right. So I'm telling you, we need to understand the body of Christ, how to be rich God's way and how to prosper God's way. And this book will do it for you. And I tell you what, if you don't like it, I'll give you your money back. Some of you got that. You got that, brother. You got that. So it's free of charge. It's our gift. Our partners and uh, me and Carly made that available for you. Free of charge, praise God. And, and just so you know, we love to travel to local churches. This is what we do nearly all the time. We do have a network of churches. We have a Bible school as well that's, that goes around the world. And we travel. We do conferences and things like that. But we love coming to local churches because this is where the life of Christ is. This is where things happen. This is where disciples are made, right in the house of God, right in a local church. So we love doing this. And we always do this at our own expense. We love traveling at our own expense and just to bless the people. So we love being here with you guys, and, um, and, and Pastor Brad said they could be anywhere this weekend. Well, there's other places we could be, but this is where we want to be, praise God. We want to be right here, so uh, we're looking forward to next time, Amen. praise God. Pastor Brad said, we'll have to get you back again. I said, you haven't heard me preach yet. <laughs> I said, you sure about that? He said, sure, so amen. We love, we love it here, so grab your Bibles, turn to it wherever you want to turn to. <laughs> I'm going to be in Luke 2, if you want to get in Luke 2. I'm going to be in Luke 2, that's where I'm going to be. And um, we'll see how we get on here today, praise God. The clock goes very fast in this place, so we'll see how we get on. This is uh, Luke 2, verse 41, and um, this is Happy Father's Day. This is a, a Father's Day message. I've never really taught this before, but this is a Father's Day message. And um, this is Luke 2, and we're going to look at verse 41, starting the story here. Luke 2, verse 41, it says his parents, Jesus' parents, went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, so Jesus was just a little boy here. We often think of Jesus as the baby in the manger, or we think of Jesus as the man. We forget that he was actually a child. He grew up. He, he's like two, three, four, five. He actually grew up. So he's 12 years old right here. And it says, um, uh, and they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. Verse 43. When they had finished the days, when the, when the feast was over, they returned. But the boy Jesus, I love how the Bible says the boy Jesus. The boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. But they assumed, they supposed that he was, uh, uh, had been in the other company. They went a day's journey and sought him among the relatives and acquaintances. They're looking for Jesus. Anyone seen Jesus? Anyone seen Jesus? They couldn't find him. So then they had to go back. They said they could not find him. They had to return to Jerusalem to seek him. Now, this is a big deal, okay? Not only did they lose their child, they lost the savior of the world. I mean, this is like, this is pretty serious right here. It's one thing to lose your child. They lost, they, it's like, I just lost God. I mean, Mary knew... <laughs> Mary knew who he was. Like, I, this is a big deal. And if you've ever had small children, it's e sometimes they're easy to lose. They're slippery, those kids. We've lost our kids. I mean, we, we had three children, and they're not children now, they're adults, 21, 
Our boy Zach is 21, our second son Josh is 20, and our, our daughter is Hannah, 18. And um, I know we look too young to have kids that age, but what can I say? You know, in England, we have children at like 10 years old. So anyway, <laughs> so we had three kids under three, and when they were babies, it was tough. I mean, we was on a plane one time, and I had, I think I had Josh with me, and he was like a year old or, or eight months old or something like that, just crawling. So I put him down at my feet. You know, I'm against the window seat, three row, put him down at my feet, and they're all cramped in there, and I'm, I'm, I'm helping the other kids. And then five minutes later, I look up, and four rows down the plane, four rows, a guy holds up this toddler and says, is this anyone's baby? Said, That's my baby right there. He'd crawled under the, under the deal. Until one time we lost him so bad in a mall, a shopping mall. They closed the shopping mall down. They got the security out, the police. I mean, it was serious. He was gone for probably 15 minutes. I said half an hour in the first service, but guys, I know about 15 minutes, but it felt like hours, you know, and, it, and they're taking pictures. They're, they're doing, the, you know, uh, asking all these details. They shut them all down. They're putting loudspeaker things out, and we're there with the police, and I'm like, the world has stopped spinning. I'm like terrified, and as I'm stood there like this, and we're talking to the police, we see this hand come out from under the counter, grab some candy, and go back under again. I was like, are you kidding me? I pull the curtain back. He's under the counter, stealing candy, chocolate all over his mouth. I was like, so I spanked him and I hugged him and I spanked him and I hugged him and I spanked him and I hugged him. But this is, I mean, they lost Jesus. We've got to understand this is a big deal. And they didn't just lose him for 10 minutes or an hour or even a day. They lost him for three days. Let's pick this back up. Verse 46. Now it was that after three days that they found him. They lost Jesus for three days. Three days after they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Verse 47, Luke 2, verse 47. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. A little side note here is interesting. It says here that Jesus was listening to them and asking them questions. But if you notice the next verse, it says, but they heard him and were astonished at his answers. And you know, Jesus wasn't just listening to them and just asking them questions. He was answering the questions they couldn't answer. He was asking the right questions. God knows how to ask the right questions of us. And if God's asking you a question, it's not because he needs the answer. It's because he needs you to understand the answer. Okay? So, so anyway, they were astonished at these 12-year-old boys teaching the, the, the leaders, teaching the teachers, teaching the rabbis things. It's amazing. So... Where are we? Verse, verse uh, 48. So when they saw him, they were, they were amazed. And the mother said, and his mother Mary said, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Can you imagine? I mean, she must have been, I mean, on one hand happy, on the other hand mad. You know, that, and listen to this, verse 49. This is our key verse today. Verse 49. Luke 2, 49. It says, and, when Jesus, and then Jesus said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? I must be about my father's business. If you want a title for this message, Happy Father's Day, men. If you want a title for this message, it's being about our father's business. We need to be about our father's business. We need to be about our father's business. Let's finish this story up here, verse uh, 50. But they did not understand the statement in which Jesus spoke to them. Then he went down from them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. Basically, Mary did not let Jesus out of her sight anymore. <laughs> He's subject to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. Verse 52, a great verse. And Jesus increased in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and men. How many of you know Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men? And you might say, Ashley, we're complete in Christ. Colossians 2.9, amen, you are complete in Christ. When you received the life of Christ, spiritually speaking, you became just like Jesus. Right. When I heard this, man, I thought, this is heresy. I thought, you can't say I'm just like Jesus. This is terrible. Like, and I said, Lord, you're going to have to show me some verses. The Holy Spirit was like, how many do you want? And he showed me, like, you know, 1 John 4, 17. As he is, so are you in this world. He showed me uh, John 17, 23. Jesus is praying. John 17, verse 23. He says, Father, I thank you that you love them, talking about us, just exactly as you love me. I'm telling you what, in your spirit, when you receive the life of Christ, you become one spirit with the Lord. In fact, it's hard to tell when you end and Jesus starts. So like Pastor Brad said earlier, you are one spirit with the Lord. The Lord knows your name. The Lord knows every hair on your head. So powerful. You are just like Jesus in your spirit. So you are complete in him. There's nothing more you can do to be more complete in Christ. But that's your spirit. We also have a soul and a body, right, with three parts being. And we have, our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions, our character, if you like. And that's the part that needs renewing. That's the part that doesn't fully understand everything. That's the part that Jesus that had to be um, uh, grow, had to increase in stature and favor. 
and in favor of man and favor of God. If Jesus had to grow in those things, how do you know we have to grow in those things? And we do that by renewing our mind. We don't do it by working. We don't do it by striving. How we do it is, is finding out who we already are. In fact, if you want to find out what you look like in the flesh, you look in the mirror, right? Some of you like use that mirror in the car to put your makeup on and stuff, right? Okay? It's like you look in the mirror to see what you look like in the flesh. Right. If you want to feel who you are in the, in the soul, like in your feelings, you check your feelings. Do I feel sad? Do I feel happy? Do I feel, you know, do I feel joy? Do I feel these things? They're your feelings, right? And be careful. Your feelings can lie to you. Your emotions can lie to you. There's nothing wrong with emotions, but they're not meant to lead you. You're meant to lead them. Okay? So if you're led by emotions, you're one minute going to be up, one minute going to be down. You need to lead your emotions rather than emotions leading you. But there's nothing wrong with emotions. God's given us emotions. So if you want to know what's going on in your soul, you check your emotions. But if you want to know what's going on in your spirit, that's the real you, by the way. The real you is a spirit. You possess a soul and you live in a body. The real you is the spiritual you. There's only one way you can find out who you are in the spirit. And that's looking in the Word of God. That's looking in the mirror of the Word. The mirror is a Word. And you look in there and you go, the Word says I'm righteous. The Word says I'm favored. The Word says I'm accepted in the beloved. The Word says I'm blessed with every spiritual blessing. The Word says this is who I am in Christ. That's who you really are. You must say, I don't feel like it. My body don't act like it. That doesn't matter. The real you is a spirit. And until you line yourself up with who you are in the spirit, you're going to be run around. And you might, you'll be born again. You, you, God loves you and everything else. But you won't actually see that life of Christ manifest in your everyday life. And you won't actually see the results of it because you're not releasing it through the Word of God. That's one of the most important reasons why we need to read the Word, to find out who we are. That's why you need to come to a church like this and get taught by Pastor Brad to find out who you are. That's why you need to go to gospel circles to find out who you are. The whole Christian life, if you like, is just finding out who you are in Christ, how much he loves you, praise God. So we go to the Word of God to find out who we are. And I'm telling you, as we do that, we're going to increase, praise God. So what's the Father's business? We're going to look at this today. Jesus said, I must be about my Father's business. I'm here to tell you, church, we can't be about good ideas. We can't be about other people's ideas. We can't be about what our parents think, what our kids think, what our neighbor thinks. We must be about the Father's business. We must be about God's business. And let me tell you, in today's, I'm excited about what's going on at the moment. There's some craziness happening. And I remember in, in March 2020, I got up real early and I gave a word. I think I put it on Facebook. And I said, this is a reformation. I said, there is not going to be any, there's not going to be back to normal. Because everyone's like, we just, we, it was just before the lockdown and things were starting to go crazy. And they were talking about lockdowns. And I come out and I said, there's not going to be normal. We're not just going to go back to normal. And everyone's like, don't speak it out, Ashley. But I'm like, no, we're not, it's gonna, you can't do this to the whole world and expect to go back to normal. Right. But the Lord showed me, it's like, this is a reformation. This is like a great awakening. There's a deforming of what we're used to, our comfort. And there's going to be a great move of God because of this. I'm telling you, this is, if you're born again, if, you, if, if you're a believer today, it's a great time to be alive. And the Lord showed me the world is taking one big step back. How many you can testify the last 14, 15 months, we've seen the world take one big step back. I mean, they've gone crazy. They're calling good evil and evil good. They don't know what to fight and, you know. So they've taken one big step back, but the Lord told me the body of Christ is going to take two big steps forward. The body of Christ is taking two big steps forward. And I'm telling you what, it's time, it's time we need to understand that it's God's will for us. And in fact, let me read you this scripture. I wasn't going to go there, but I feel led to go there. Um, this is Exodus 11, verse 7. Exodus 11, verse 7. There was plagues. You know, during the Exodus, there was plagues that came out. And all these plagues affected the Egyptians. Remember, the Israelites were in captivity. All these plagues uh, affected the Egyptians, and there was house storms that actually killed all their crops and killed all their cattle. Their cattle died. Um, they had darkness, gross darkness. There was locusts and frogs and flies and blood in the water, all sorts of things. It's, like, it's basically like 2020. 2020 was like the plagues. It? It, like, it was like we had the coronavirus, we had the riots, we had the po politics. I mean, it's like... It was, it was, so what happened, though, very interestingly enough, the Israelites, I'm not going to dwell here, I just want to share this, the Israelites had all these things, uh, the Egyptians had all these things happen to them, but the Israelites, they lived in the same area, but they lived in a place called Goshen, and in Goshen, they did not have the effects of the plagues. It was completely supernatural. So much so, when the howl came and killed all the, all the cattle, Pharaoh himself said, go down and check the Israelites, go and check their cattle, and they reported back to him and said, no, it's true. Not one of their cattle have died. All the Egyptians' cattle dead. Not one of the Israelites' cattle died. When it was darkness, it was such gross darkness, they couldn't see in front of their own face. It was light in all the uh, Israelites' dwellings. Just think about it. It's just supernatural. When all the crops died of the Egyptians, the Israelites' crops didn't die. When the, when the Egyptians' children died, the, the Israelites' children didn't die. They lived in Goshen, the same area, but they lived in Goshen. They were protected by the Lord. They have a covenant with the Lord. I mean, to tell you, you've got a greater covenant than the Israelites had. 
You've got a greater covenant, and that whatever happens in the world, you don't have to be affected for it. Now, by, by it, you can believe for it and receive it if you want. You can believe that you can be in fear and, and watch the news. Don't sit and watch the news. If you watch the news, if you watch, if you watch half an hour of the news, you better water it down with 10 hours of the word. <laughs> so, don't just sit there. I don't, care. I don't care if you watch the left news, the right news, whatever news, okay? You watch the news, it's going gonna, it's gonna to indoctrinate you and it's going to put you in fear. And it's hard to believe God when you believe that fear. And don't believe, you, there's so many things that conspiracy theories. Don't just go on YouTube and, and watch things. Have a plan, praise God. Listen to stuff that's going to give you life. But if you believe for it, you can receive the results of these plagues. But I'm here to tell you, you don't have to. You have a choice. And let me read you this one verse the Lord spoke to me to share with you, uh, just as a bonus. I wasn't going to share this, so they haven't got it probably. But Exodus 11, verse 7. Exodus 11, verse 7. Listen to this. This is powerful. Exodus 11, verse 7 says, But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue. Meaning this. None of these effects of the plagues, none of these plagues are going to affect the children of Israel one bit. Not even a dog can, can bark at you. This is, this is, and it says, Against man or beast, ready for this, that you should know that the Lord does make a difference. Hear me now, Calvary Wallace. The Lord does make a difference between Egyptians and Israelites. The Lord does make a difference between Egyptians and Israelites. Let me tell you, Calvary, the Lord does make a difference between believers and unbelievers. The Lord does make a difference between Christ followers and people that aren't following Christ. The Lord does make a difference. Now, the good news is, Acts 2.20, right? Acts 2.21, anyone, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Okay, so anyone can join us at any time, but the, the truth is there's meant to be a separation between the church and the world. And what we're going to see over these next five years, mark my words, we're going to see a greater separation between the church and the world. Up until now, if you're an American, I love America, we're American citizens, we paid tens of thousands of dollars literally to be American citizens, we went through medicals, I, went, I had to have a medical to be an American citizen, do you know that? I came, no, oh, this is a true story, I, they Carly said, you've got to go and get a medical. I said, I hate doctors. I don't. If you're a doctor, I love you. I hate the practice of going to the doctors. You know what I'm saying? They're always into nakedness. Like, put a gown on. I'm like, why have I got to put a gown on? So they gave me a gown. I was like, Carly lied to me. She said, they just want to take some blood. They don't need to get me naked to take blood. I, don't... I had a full medical. and I'm just telling you, it wasn't pleasant just to be an American citizen. I came home like this. The kid said, the kid said, how was the medical, Dad? I said, I'm proud to be an American. <laughs> so I love America, okay? I paid dearly to be an American citizen. But let me tell you, we cannot trust in the country right now. We cannot trust in the country. We was never meant to trust in the country. And one of the, one of the downsides of living in a great country like America, I happen to believe it's still the best country in the world, living in such a great country, here's the downside. We can trust in our country. And let's face it, up until recently... Anyone could be a Christian. It doesn't cost you anything. Yes, and people call themselves Christians. They're not really following Jesus. And what you're going to find, there's going to be a distinction now between believers and unbelievers. There's going to be a distinction between the world and Jesus' followers. And like I said, anyone can join at any point. It's, it's great. But I'm telling the next five years, people are going to come to you and say, take me to your leader. People are going to come to you and say, why, why aren't you freaking out? Why are you in peace? How come you're not full of fear? How come you're not scared? They say, because I've got Jesus. I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm a citizen of heaven. Hear me now. I love America, but you cannot trust in the country. We can only trust in Jesus. And we're citizens of heaven. Your first citizenship is heaven. Your first citizenship is heaven. If you've, if you've fought for this country's freedom, and, and I thank you. If you've lost loved ones, I thank you. I appreciate that so much. But compared to Jesus, compared to the gospel, compared to that citizenship in heaven. So I'm telling you, we need to trust in Jesus. We're going to see a great separation over these next five years. It's going to be awesome, praise God. For believers, it's going to be an exciting time because we're going to be able to tell people about the gospel. They're going to come to us. We're going to have to go to them. They're going to come to us and say, help me. I need help. I don't know what to do because all their foundations have been shaken. So I don't believe God did it, but I believe God's going to use it. And it's going to be an awesome time. I'm telling you, it's going to be an awesome time. So we're talking about being about our father's business. God has a business for us. He has something for us to do. He has purpose. God, did created, God didn't create anyone and say, what am I going to do with them? Every single one of you here today, God has a plan for, a purpose for. He's got a ministry for. I'm telling you, some of you think, think that, you know, I'm too old, I'm too young, I've been divorced too many times, I've messed up too many times. You are not too far for God to use you. In fact, God hasn't, God hasn't got a B plan. There's no B plan. God just has another A plan and another A plan and another A plan. And you say... But I've messed up, I've messed up, I've messed up. Well, God's grace keeps covering it, keeps covering it. Listen, listen, if God, 
what is it, First Peter, he says, you know what, God is long-suffering, right? He's not slack concerning his promises, he's long-suffering. A day is like a thousand years. He said to the disciples, behold, I come back quickly. Well, that was 2,000 years ago. So we know, look at this, we know Jesus is quickly is at least 2,000 years. So if his quick is 2,000 years, how long is his long-suffering? Let me tell you, you can't live long enough, you can't live long enough to make God mad at you. You can't live God, you can't, God's, God's anger is long-suffering. He, his mercy is a long-suffering. He's, I mean, you can't live long enough to anger God. So it doesn't matter how many times you've messed up, come back to the Father, run to the throne room of grace, and he'll put you right back on track again. He'll give you that A plan right again. And he's so good, he's so good, I'm telling you what. His A, his a plan is better than the, the last A plan. It's just, he just works it all out, praise God. So don't run from God, run to God. But every single one of you, God has a purpose for. He's got a business for you. Jesus said, I'm about my father's business. What was Jesus' business? What was he about? He was about knowing him. He was about knowing his father. He'd spend all night praying. The apostle Paul says it so eloquently in Philippians. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. We've got to know Christ. And I got born again at 16. I didn't grow up a Christian. Our, our parents were, my parents were heathens. And they were good heathens. Good worldly heathens. And uh, I resisted God. Like my mum got born again. And, I was, and she got born again about six months before me. She read a book. And at the end of the book, she said the sinner's prayer. And she started acting weird. And I was like, what's happened to mum? She's acting weird. <laughs> I'd go out and like, take the bumper stickers, Jesus bumper stickers off the car and things like that. I was like, don't tell me about that Jesus. Don't tell me about God. And then one night I was asleep in bed and God woke me up with an audible voice in my bedroom. Bam, it's Ashley. And it woke me up. And it happened about four or five times throughout the night. The next morning I said, mum, did you call me last night? I'm 16 years old. She said, no. She said, but I was reading the passage. I was praying for you, she said, and I was reading the passage about Eli and about Samuel. And when, when Eli, when the Lord called Samuel, he said, it's the Lord speaking to you. She said, when you go to bed tonight, answer him. I was like, I can't sleep. Like, this is, this is crazy. So I, right then and there, I said, Jesus, if you're real, help me. And right then, I received the life of Christ. And my life completely changed. It was like a Damascus Road conversion. I completely changed. But here's what I did. I was like, I'm going to please God. I'm, I read that verse, you know, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I'm, I'm going to double down, baby. I love Jesus. So I'm all in. I'm, Carly will tell you, I'm pretty extreme. When I go about something, I'm all in. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love Jesus, and I'm going to prove my love for Jesus by following his, by keeping his commands, keeping the law. So I got zealous, man. I, I mean, I, I become a zealot. I, got, I, got, I, I, got, I had so much zeal for the law. I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a good Christian. I'm going to love God. And have you know, you can't love God like that. You haven't got the ability to love God like that. So we've got to be careful when we're talking about being about our father's business. This is not a striving, not a working. If you get to that point, what will happen is, is you'll try to perform for God, and you can't do that. It's the opposite. It's when you let go and say, God, I can't do anything for you. See, we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. So until we understand how much God loves us, we can't really love him anyway. We haven't even got the ability to love him anyway. And that verse, when the verse is like when Jesus said, if you love me, follow my commandments, it's because if you understand how much I love you, you're naturally going to want to follow me. It's a fruit, not a root. It's just a byproduct. You'll live more holy by accident when you understand how much God loves you than you will on purpose. One of the worst things you can do is be sin conscious. I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to sin. The first thing you can do is go and sin. I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to sin. That's why, that was my whole life going around in circles. Every prayer time, I was like, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. I, oh, Lord. And that was my whole prayer life, apologizing to God. Jesus has taken it. Jesus has taken our sin. Everything past, present, and future, Jesus has taken it to the cross. So we don't have to do that anymore. Now what we do is, is we accept Jesus' love for us. Right. And when you understand how much God loves you, I tell you what, it will change your life. I know many of you have already done this, but it's, it's not a one-time thing. We can do this the rest of our lives. Just keep thanking God for how much he loves you. I love it in, um, you know, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, after he was baptized, the, the spirit of the Lord uh, came down on Jesus in the form of a dove, and the voice of heaven came out and it said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I, I, I say this, and my kids don't like it. They say, Dad, that's a bit cheesy, but I like it. I say, really, if you really want to know what the Christian life is, if you like, what we've got to do is, is we've got to be loved. We just got to let the Lord love us, be loved. And Jesus, the God the Father said to Jesus, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He says the same thing to us. You're his beloved child in whom he's well pleased. And it doesn't matter where you've been, what you're doing. He sees you and says, This is my beloved child in whom, not what you're going to do for me, but in whom, who you are. Inside, that's who he's pleased with. Everything else is just a fruit. And he, says that to, he said that to Jesus when he was baptized, and he said it again at the Mount of Transfiguration. He said, this time he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. He's got some things to teach you. 
And, and that's actually recorded seven times. I think it's good, one for every day of the week. Read that and say, I'm God's beloved child in whom he's well pleased. Thank you, Lord, I'm your beloved child in whom I'm well pleased. Start saying that, confess that, and start brainwashing yourself with that, because that's the truth. And we have to renew our mind, right, to the truth. So Jesus spent time knowing the Father. We need to spend time knowing Jesus, finding out who we are in Christ, and accepting his love for us. And you meditate on that love and say, God, thank you that you love me. That's got to be the foundation. It has to be the foundation. We do that, and we actually, we actually take that on. The next thing we have to do is understand that if we're going to love him, we need to follow him. Jesus says to his disciples, follow me. Again, this is not a, a hardship like, I've got to follow God. And no, it's a follow me. I'm going to show you how to live the abundant life. Right. John 10.10, 10, in John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. Right. He did not say, I've come to give you life and I'm going to give you some, some restrictions. I'm going to give you some rules to follow. I'm going to give you some hard work to do. I'm going to give you things to do you can't quite do. And if, No, he's just said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. Amen. So that means everything God asks you to do is going to be for your good. Everything he asks you to do is going to be for your good. So why would you not want to follow him? In fact, I tell people, if Jesus is your Lord, then if you say no, Lord, that's an oxymoron. Think about it. If he's your Lord, you can't say no to your Lord. You say, yes, Lord. How high? Now, I followed God for 12 years thinking he was an angry God, mean, and, you know, he was mad at me, just about tolerated me. When I found out that God loved me, man, how much easier was it then? I was like, I'm following a God, and everything he tells me to do is because he loves me. Everything he tells me to do because he loves me. The rich young ruler came to him. You know the story of the rich young ruler, right? He came to him, and uh, Jesus looked at him, and it says, Jesus looked at him, loved him. I love this. It says, Jesus looking at him, loved him. And Jesus said to him, one thing you lack. He said, I've been a good boy. I've done all these things. He was rich, he was young, and he was a ruler. That's a good combination. I mean, he had the power, he had the, he had the money, he was young enough to enjoy it. That's a good co- Usually one of those get away from us, right? So, so he was a rich young ruler, and Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said, one thing you lack. Guess what he lacked? He was trusting money instead of trusting God. Yeah, come on. So one thing you like is to go and give, sell everything you have, give all the money to the poor, and then come and follow me. Did Jesus do that to take from the rich young ruler? No, he did it for his own good. Yeah. And if the rich young ruler had done that, he would have actually received an abundance more because it says whoever gives up things in this life is going to receive a hundredfold. So he would have actually had it multiplied back to him. But he said the rich young ruler went away sad because he had great wealth. He trusted money more than he trusted God. Yeah. Matthew, what is that, 6.24, Matthew 6.24, you cannot serve God and mammon. So the reason why Jesus said that to him is because he loved him. The reason why Jesus asked us to do things in the flesh or in our soul is difficult. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but sometimes God will ask you to do things, and you're like, man, I don't want to do that. Well, that's your soul and your, your flesh. Your spirit's like, woohoo, let's go. Live by faith. Obedience. It's almost like a dirty word now obedience. God is very interested in our obedience. Do you know why he wants you to obey him? You know why he's interested in your obedience? Think about this. Don't miss this. The reason why he wants you to obey him isn't because he's a, he's a tyrant and his, you know, his ego is like, I want everyone to follow me or else and everything else. That's how I used to think God is. That's not. The reason why he wants us to obey him is because he loves us so much, he wants only the best for us. And his ways are the best ways possible. They're going to give us the most joy, the most satisfaction, the most purpose. So he wants us to obey him because he only has good for, uh, for us. So we have to learn to obey God. You know, the just, you're just today. If, if you've received the life of Christ, you are just. You're justified. Just as if I'd never sinned, right? So you're justified. So you're just today. It says the just shall live by faith. The just don't vacation by faith. You know what? I think this week I'm going to live by faith. Pastor, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to live by faith. No, no, we're meant to live by faith all the time, not just on the weekends, not just on Sunday morning. Where you want to live by faith? I'll tell you what, Monday morning when you're at work and you've got that colleague who's giving you a hard time, or when you get overlooked and have a promotion, or when it looks like you can't pay the rent, or when one of your kids has run off, or when your, your spouse is mad at you. That's when living by faith really hits the road. Because what are you going to do then? You're going to live by faith. You're going to trust the Lord. You're going to love and forgive. You're going to trust God for your promotion. You're going to trust God with your spouse. You're going to live for him. So living by faith, I'm telling you, is obedience. It's trusting God and doing what God tells us. And we know that by the word. You know, James 1 says, don't be hearers of the word only. Be doers. If you just hear the word, you're deceiving yourself. We need to hear the word and do it. At this church, you're going to hear the word. The question is, are you going to go and do it? And again, it's easy because he's going to give you the ability to do it. Don't fear. During this pandemic and all this craziness, don't fear. Jesus told us, do not fear. Jesus would not tell you to do something he hasn't already equipped you to do. So he's telling you to do not fear because he's already equipped you 
with a spirit of faith. He's already equipped you with boldness and a sound mind and love. You don't have to fear. He's already equipped you. He's, he's only got good things for us. So obey God, praise God. Get to know him. Understand how much he loves you and follow him. He'll tell you to do things. He told us in 2008, he said, he said move to America. I was like, man. Moved to 2008. We had three little kids. Moved to America. We had no real plan. There was a Bible school that we'd graduated from in England, and they had a program in Colorado, and we could volunteer there for one year. So we went to volunteer at the Bible school, and we flew over to America with no plan, emigrated. I'd never been here before. Emigrated. We, we bought our three little kids, 16 suitcases, about 14 of them were full of kids' toys. Okay, we came over here, we had no plan, we lived in someone's basement, and I'm telling you very quickly what happened was, is God started to prosper us and show us things, but it wasn't always easy, there was sometimes I was like, how are we going to make it Lord? And I remembered, no, God told us to do this, and I didn't just sit back and just pray, I put my hand to things, I did things, I actually, you know, put the word in action, confessed things, blessed people, gave, put my hands to things, be productive, you know, two thirds of God's name is go, think about that, right, so we're meant to go and do things, because he's already, he's already deposited in us. We need to be about our father's business, amen? So we come over it and, it, and it worked out. It wasn't always easy, but it worked out. I tell people this. Obey God and leave all the consequences to him. That's right. Right. Obey God and leave all the consequences to him. We need to be about our father's business. And here's the deal. Grace has already provided everything we need. That's right. Think about this. By grace, really, Jesus was grace personified. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And he came down. He provided everything for us, just like I said, the, the, financially, mentally, physically, spiritually. He's provided everything for us on the cross. In fact, um, the Apostle Paul puts it in Romans 8, 37. He says, in all these things, you are more than conquerors. More than conquerors. You are more than a conqueror in Christ. He's already provided everything you need to walk out everything he's got for you. He's already provided more than enough for you to be about the Father's business. You've already got it inside of you. You are more than conquerors. I mean, one time I asked the Lord, I said, what's more than a conqueror? He showed me this illustration. My kids said, Dad, you share that illustration everywhere you go. I said, until I find a better one. But more than a conqueror for me. Imagine two heavy, this is you today. Imagine two heavyweight boxers. Now, when I was a kid, I used to watch, was it, um, we had, was it Lennox Lewis, I think we had, and, and you had Mike Tyson. And Mike Tyson whipped all our English guys. It was, it was terrible. But anyway, so there'd be, I actually had a friend who was a boxer. And he was a born-again believer. He was a Christian. He was a boxer. I said, how do you reconcile that? And he said, he's I just punch him in Jesus' name. He said, <laughs> And then I prayed for them afterwards. Did I pray? I, said, I guess what you call five-fold ministry. I'm like, okay, so imagine two heavyweight boxers and they're fighting and, they're, and they go the distance, right? And then finally one of them knocks the other one down, right? And the other one's a knockout. And they, you've seen that. And they lift up his arms and he's a little bit beaten. I mean, he's been fighting. He's like, Adrian, you know, it's like that. He goes, they say, he's the champion of the world. They say, this man is the champion of the world. He's the world champion. They give him a big gold belt. Have you seen that big old gold belt they put on him? And then they bring him a purse, right? Which I think is interesting. I mean, he's a man. Don't like, bring him a check or a wallet, but a purse seems a bit girly, you know what I'm saying? So they bring him a purse, and that could be what, $50 million. You've seen this, right? $50 million. So there's the fighter. They lift up his arms. They say, he is the conqueror of the world. He's the, he's the world champion. He's $50 million, world champion. They declare it. He's been fighting. He's deserved it. He's won. In walks his wife. She jumps over the rope. She walks across the canvas confidently. She leans up and kisses him on the cheek. And she takes that $50 million prize money and she goes down to the mall to spend it. Now, here's a conqueror. She's more than a conqueror. Listen, in Christ, you are more than conquerors. Jesus has paid it all for you. Jesus has done the hard work. Our relationship with Jesus receives everything he's already paid for. I'm telling you, church, everything you need is in Christ and he's paid the price for you. He's done the hard work so you don't have to. All you have to do is receive it by faith. That's our part by faith. Grace has provided it. The faith walk is just walking across that canvas, kissing Jesus and taking the prizes and going and spending it. And there's nothing brings God honor more than a bold believer that says, I'm taking what's mine. Matthew 11, 11 says the violent take it by force. I'm here to tell you, church, it's your right. Healing is your right. Prosperity is your right. I'm telling you, righteousness is your right. Peace of mind is your right. No fear is your right. And you might say, Pastor, that's a, that's a selfish thing. No, 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 because it's going to help other people. You know, when you're on the airplanes, they say, put your own oxygen mask on before you help someone else. 
you can't give away what you haven't got. You've heard Pastor Brad say that. You can't give away what you haven't got yourself. You receive the life of Christ. You receive these things, and then you can give them away, and you can help more people, and you can turn the world right side up. I'm here to tell you, Calvary Wallace, there's a, there's a scripture in Acts. I believe it's Acts 17, somewhere around there. And they said, these few men have turned the world upside down. Matthew, um, Acts 16, I believe it's. These few men have turned the world upside down. I'm here to tell you, they were not the apostles. They were regular believers. They looked for the apostles. They couldn't find them. So they drugged the regular brethren in. And they said, these few brethren have turned the world upside down. Let me tell you, we need to be about our father's business. And our father's business is not just for the ministers, the so-called quote-unquote pulpit ministers. You know, in Ephesians 11, it says that Jesus gave some to be apostles, right? Some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers. They're the fivefold ministry. Some. But why did he give those gifts to the body of Christ? You can read it. Ephesians 11. Ephesians 4 verse 11. It says, for the equipping of the saints. Who are the saints? You're the saints right here. We're all saints. When you received the life of Christ, you became a saint in him. And why did the saints need equipping? It says, for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the work of the ministry. You are called to do the work of the ministry. You are called to be about the Father's business. Every single one of you is called to ministry, is called to minister. You might be a truck driver. You might be a stay-home parent. You might be a school teacher, a doctor, a lawyer. But really, you're a minister. Believers lay hands on the sick and they recover. You don't have to bring people here to receive the life of Christ. You don't have to bring people here to get prayer and to get born again. You go and lay hands on the sick. You're going to meet people pastors Brad and Katie will never meet. You go and lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. You go and minister the life of Christ to people. You are called to minister. One of the greatest tricks the devil sold the body of Christ. The day of Pentecost, people got filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus didn't do one miracle until he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And one of the greatest, like the the Holy Spirit descended, all the body of Christ got filled with the Holy Spirit. They had the same power of Jesus on the inside of them. The devil thought, man, I've blown it now. There was one Jesus. Now there's thousands of them. I'll sell the body of Christ a lie and I'll tell them that only the ministers, quote unquote, can do the ministry. Everyone else, they just watch and don't do anything about it. In the first Reformation, only the priests could read the Bible. And the people couldn't read the Bible. They said, don't read the Bible, it'll make you crazy. Well, have you know, we have the, have the Word of God now, right? In this Reformation, what's happening is, is the body of Christ are going to realize they're called to do the ministry, not just the ministers. The ministers are the coaches. We're the equippers. We're the trainers to equip you to do the work of the ministry. You are called to do the work of the ministry. You're called to, to, to flow in the spiritual gifts. You're called to give words of knowledge, words of wisdom. You're called to lay hands on the sick. You're called to do this work. We're called to be about our Father's business. And it starts with knowing who you are in Christ. And then, it's, and then you start listening to what God tells you through his word and through his spirit. Go do this, go do that, and you obey. It takes faith to do it. But God wants to immobilize his, or mobilize his army right now in these times. And we're in times now where we need the body of Christ to step up and lead and be the hands and feet of Jesus right now. And every single one of you has a part to play. Every single one of you has a part to play. When we come together in unity, there's a commanded blessing on unity. We can turn Wallace right side up. We can turn North Carolina right side up. We can turn this country. We can turn this world right side up for Jesus, praise God. I'm excited because God wants every single one of you in an intimate relationship with him. And it's not just to stay there. It's so that he can, you can be his hands and feet. He can use you, praise God, to reach others. He wants to establish his covenant right here. He wants to show people his love and his power, the power of God. Filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with power and his love, praise God. And you're called to do that. You are called to do that today. Man, I'm going to ask Carly up. We're going to pray for you and Pastor Brad. And we're going to, I want to pray for you, praise God. There's, there's so much more to say, but I want to pray for you and impart to you. This is God's will for you, that you be about your father's business. Be about your father's business. He has things for you to do. He has people for you to meet. He has places for you to go. He has divine connections for you. He has divine appointments for you. It starts with understanding his love. And then just serving, just obeying wherever he sends you. But you, I mean, there's assignments here. Pastor Brad, this church is full of ministers. Like this is not, this is like, this is like an army training camp right here. It's like a boot camp. And through gospel circles and through Sunday mornings and all these things you're doing, you're training up an army. All you pastors are training up armies of people to go out and spread the gospel, to go out and spread the life of Christ throughout these communities. Man, I'm excited. Thank you, Jesus, Colin. Jesus. Can we just stand up for a moment, church, and pray? If you've got a prayer language, just to begin to use it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that your presence is in this place. Your presence is in your people right now. I hear the Spirit of God say, Pastor Brad, he sees you as a foundation builder. 
You are a set of foundation builder. You're not a builder of buildings alone, but a builder of people. You're restoring the waste places. You're building a foundation in people on which they can build big houses, big churches, big ministries are going to come out of this man, says the Lord. Big ministries. They're going to go touch the world in Jesus' name. Healings, miracles, signs, wonders. The power gets flowing through you, Pastor Brad. Generation upon generation upon generation. He is, this is, you are my child, my son, who I've called in from the wilderness to plant, to build, to root out, to tear down, to restore the waste places, says the Lord. Thank you, God. Restoration is your ministry, man of God. Restoration is your ministry. This is from Isaiah 61. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Yes, to preach the good news and to heal the brokenhearted and proclaim liberty to the captives and the open of the prison to the blind. But more than that, this is your part, Calvary Church Wallace, to preserve those in, who mourn in Zion and to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they might be called the trees of righteousness. They might be called the trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. Listen to this, verse 4. That they shall build the old ruins and raise up the former desolations and they shall repair the waste cities, the waste of the cities for the desolations of many generations. Many generations are going to come from Calvary Wallace. Many generations of men and women of God. Many books, many ministries, many television outreaches are going to come from right here. From right here, we are the they. We are the they, amen, to restore the waste places. And he says here, instead of your shame, this is for someone now, come on now. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. You're here for a purpose, not by accident. You're here for a purpose. Instead of humiliation, they shall rejoice over their portion. Therefore, in their land, in their land, somebody needs to say, in my land, in my land, they shall possess a double portion, for everlasting joy shall be theirs. Amen. I'm so excited to see what comes from this church. Ministry of reconciliation. Praise God. Restoration. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I want to do this. I, I, I really felt... Just a couple of minutes ago that we need to that, that, that there's something on this and I'll have Ashley and Carly pray there's people in this place and you really have questioned your purpose like you you, you can you hear that God loves you and you think okay that's great and man I'm thankful for that but you really question whether or not God has a purpose for you are you disqualified for what God's called you to are you damaged goods that he's that he's no longer going to use and you have had these thoughts that have run through your head and you have really failed to pursue purpose because you question whether or not God even had one for you. And that's what I want to do in this moment. If that's you, if you have questioned your purpose or you have felt like you didn't have purpose or you're even thinking to yourself, I don't even know what purpose is. I'm just, I am wandering through life. And maybe it was because you got derailed because something in life happened to you that was even beyond your control. Maybe you have always felt this way. If that's you, if you've questioned your purpose, then I want you to meet me down in front of this altar right now. If that's you, come on down. I want to pray for you. Come on down. Come on, come on. Because God has a purpose and a plan for you. I'm going to give you just a moment if there's anybody else. Maybe you had, you knew what your purpose was, but something happened along the way and it caused you to start to think, you know what? That wasn't me. That wasn't God. That wasn't, that wasn't in the cards. And so you, you gave up on it. You let it die. As you just meet us down here right now, we're, we're going to pray over you. Praise God. Look at me right quick. Look at me all, all over this place. I don't care what your situation is. It doesn't matter what you've gone through. 
what's happened to you. It could have been poor choices you made or stuff that was beyond your control. It doesn't matter. I want you to hear me loud and clear. I don't care how old you think you are or how you think that, man, something, you know, missed opportunities passed you. But I want you to hear me right now. God is not finished with you. I want you to hear this loud and clear. Miles Carter, I want you to hear me. Donna, God is not finished with you. God is not finished with you. What he has put in your heart is not some pipe dream. It is a reality you're going to walk in. He's not finished with you. He has a plan for you. He has purpose for you. Nothing you have done can derail. Listen, God is not a man he can lie. When he spoke you into the earth, he spoke your purpose. And it can't return unto him void. It's got to do what he sent it to do. You are a word God spoke into the earth. You can't go back to him void. You must complete what he's put in your heart. And some of you are feeling like you're, you're unfulfilled. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, I don't know. You know, I, I, I just, I'm missing something. I'm missing something. No, it's just that you're not walking in purpose. That's it. You have everything you need. You heard him say you have everything you need to do it. But the fulfillment comes when you walk in it. It's not that you're missing anything. You feel like you're missing it because you're not walking in purpose. And so I want to ask them to pray over you right now. And I want you to receive this. And I want you to hear, when they speak, this is God speaking. I want you to hear this. But I want you to have it just so settled in your heart that no matter what the enemy tries to speak to you when you walk out through those double doors, it will not rob what God has spoken into your spirit today. There is a heavenly deposit that's about to take place in your heart that enemy cannot steal or destroy. Get ready to receive right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters here. I just hear the Lord say, I have a place for you. I have a place for you in my house. I have a seat for you in my, ta my table. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that right now on the inside of them, you are developing the picture. Developing the picture, bringing all things to clarity in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, for those of you that are, that are sitting trying to make a decision. You've got, you got options, and you don't know which way to go. But you want the God option, not the good option. The God option, not the good option. There is going to be some doors that open and some doors that close. Do not be remorseful about the doors that close behind you because they weren't supposed to be opened. They weren't, You won't want to go through those doors. Right now, I thank you, Lord, for just making making the way obvious, for cutting out of confusion. God says, I'm not the author of that confusion that you've been suffering. I'm not the author of that confusion. I'm not the author of that doubt, that anxiety, that fear. Right now, I speak boldness over you, boldness over you. I thank you, Lord, for making that path so clear. It's like it's lit up with street lamps that you can't even miss it. You can't even miss it. I thank you. God says right now, you don't have to be afraid of making a mistake. You don't have to be afraid of making a mistake. I did not make a mistake when I made you, when I chose you, when I set you in my house, in my body, at my table, and made you part of my family. I did not make any mistakes, and I didn't start with you. You are not an accident. You are perfectly created with everything that I need you to be for the purpose that I've called you to. I hear the Lord say, do the last thing I told you to do. Oh, that's a strong word. You need to do the last thing, complete the very last thing that I told you to do. And then when you've completed that, then you'll know the next step. Then you'll know the next step. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for helping us be willing and able and obedient to the word that you've called us to do for bringing those things back to our remembrance, even things, words that have been spoken over us. Some of you have had words that are spoken over you as an infant, as a babe in arms, promises, words that people have spoken over you that you haven't yet seen come to pass. But let me tell you, there's not one word that God has spoken to you or over you that's going to come back void. Not one word. They're still good. They haven't expired. They're as good today as they were the day that they were spoken over you. Those dreams, those visions, they will come to pass. They will not repent. They will not return void. They will prosper in the very thing that I sent it for, says the Lord. And no mistake that you have made is going to shipwreck that plan. 
No mistake that you, no matter how far you've run, you can't run far enough to get away from me, says God. You can't run, you can't hide. I know your name. I know your name. Thank you, God. There's no problem here, says the Lord. There's no problem. There's no lack of resources for me to get you where you need to go. There's no lack of vision for me to get you where I need you to be. I have limitless resources. I have more for you. I have more for your family. I have more for your finances. I have more for your children, for your workplace. Everything, that every place that you set, the sole of your feet is blessed by your presence. Oh man, that's a good one. Every, Every place that you set, the sole of your feet is blessed by your presence. The only person that needs to see it is you. Is you. Some, God says, some of you, you're just your own worst enemy. You need to keep your mouth shut a little more. Right? Because there's things coming out of your mouth that are sowing seeds and bearing fruit that aren't good. Amen. But God says good things about you. You got to start getting your speaker matched up to your believer. Right? Start speaking out what you believe, not what you feel. Start speaking out what the Word of God says. Start making your confession match His confession. Start declaring over yourselves, I can do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I will accomplish the plans and the purposes that God has for me. I do have direction. I do have purpose. I am a child of God. Everything I touch prospers and I have no lack. I do have the strength in my body to get through every day. I do have the vision on the inside of me to accomplish what he set for me to do. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we believe and we receive your perfect plan, your provision, and your propulsion into this in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just receive on the inside of us boldness to stand up against the lies that have plagued our understanding, the self-doubt, the anxiety, the belief. Right now, we cast down those vain imaginations in Jesus' name. And we say, Lord, we are who you say we are. We are who you say we are. We can do what you say we can do. And we will be who you call us to be. In Jesus' name, we believe and we receive. And the people said, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, all over this building, will you give God a praise for that word? Hey, now listen, hold on, listen, listen. Before y'all go back to your seat, don't you, you remember what we said? Do not let the enemy convince you that God didn't make a deposit, that he hadn't spoken to you this morning. Because you walk out that door and he's going, oh, that was just church. That was just a show. That was, no, let me tell you something. The Spirit of the Lord just spoke. And and what the Spirit of the Lord says is truth. Whether you believe it or not, doesn't doesn't mean it doesn't matter. It's true regardless. So, But if you'll believe it, you partner your faith with the promises of God, then you'll see what you believe. You're not going to believe it when you see it. You're going to see it when you begin to believe it. In Jesus' name. Hey, before we go, one second. I got a word. It's Patsy and Lisa. If you would, just will you, will you step out right here. I just want to speak her. I just heard the Lord say something. We were on this platform. And I want to be sensitive to this, but I, want to, I want to just want to share with you what I just heard the Lord say. That you're, you're together for a reason. And God has brought you together now to run a similar race, hand in hand. He's got great plans for you. It's more than you you can imagine. And this is what I heard the Lord say, is you need to dream together. I don't know what that means. I have no idea. But I, I want the Lord says dream together. Bill's a part of this. Your family's a part of this. Your mother is a part of this. But I just hear the Lord saying dream together. He has put you together. The Bible says or one can put a thousand to fight two, ten thousand. There's a multiplication of what God's going to use you if, you if you'll walk together in this thing. And I know you have a, a fine, you know, I know you're close sisters and I know your bond is amazing. But I just hear the Lord saying when it comes to your dreams, dream together. There's something he wants to do through the two of you. It's going to be a blessing that's far beyond your wildest imagination. And just do it together. Hear, hear the Lord. Lord, I just speak right now. I declare the good things of God over their life. I say, I pray that you would open up their ears to hear. One ear to hear. One eye to see, one heart to receive all that you have in store for them and their family. I pray blessings over them. I pray provision and protection that everything they need to, some the, to, to see the God vision that you put inside of them come to pass. The God-sized dream that you have already given them. 
everything they need. And we declare it in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, have y'all enjoyed today? Can y'all give God thanks for the wonderful gift of Ashley and Carly Terradez? On the way out, stop by the table. Now, we're about to transition. Men, don't you leave because we're going right outside of this tent where we're going to have a drawing for that grill. You better go ahead and pray and claim it right now in Jesus' name. Love you. God bless you. Have a great Father's Day. See you outside.